to turn. But I want you to find the book of Genesis tonight, and we begin our series, Route 66. Route 66. I appreciate you being out. Got a little rain right at church time, and that always affects us. But I appreciate you being out tonight. I'm going to tell you, life is full of curveballs. 655, I'm in here. And Valerie reminds me that I need to give Deanna something. So I walked to my office, turned on my computer to print a document that I need to give Deanna, and got an email that a 41-year-old friend of mine here in Tampa Bay, who is my financial advisor, he's my, my planner, wonderful Christian, father of six, very active at Idlewild Baptist Church up in uh, Lutz, Florida, just one of the finest gentlest, nicest guys the Lord has allowed me to contact with here in these eight years in Florida. And uh, he died this weekend. Uh, leaves behind six small children. Tom, I introduce you to Tom. He was your financial advisor. Tom Laughlin passed away this weekend. Mary believes it was an accident and diving. Uh, some men from the church were out and diving. Tom went down and he never came back up avid outdoorsman, avid outdoorsman, uh, always inviting me and the boys to go hunt or uh, to do something. We never were able to take advantage of that, but we would talk about uh, retirement. We'd talk about insurance and all things that we'd come. We'd spend more time talking about the Lord than about the finances, and he would come here uh, once a month or once every few months just because he serviced several of the folks on staff, but just absolutely, my, I, I feel like I've been kicked in the stomach. Uh, just, just shocking. Forty-one, uh, six small children, wife, and uh, so let's pray for the Laughlin family. Uh, this devastating, uh, hard to imagine. Loved uh, the outdoors, loved being outside, loved to hunt, fish, and all those things. So, uh, just pray for time. Find Genesis three. We're going to get there in a moment. Let me say a few things about beginning a series like this. Number one, I've never done this before. I've never taken an overview series like this. I've always uh, try to go in depth and uh, I've already talked to one of our fine men he said preacher I'm a little nervous I've been through a series like this before and it didn't really help me that much and so I have a great fear as we begin this that uh, it would not be too simple for some that it would not be uh, too di too deep for others but would give us a good understanding of the 66 books that make up the word of God and, of course, many of you, especially you old-timers, know uh, that Route 66 ran across the heartland of our country. Uh, and it was uh, from Chicago to Santa Monica, California. And it would make stops uh, through uh, Illinois as it went out, uh, Springfield and Rolla, Missouri, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Shamrock, Amarillo, Texas, Santa Rosa, Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, Holbrook, Winslow, Arizona. Some of you know famous line in the song, standing on a corner in Winslow, Arizona. Flagstaff, Kingman, Bartow, uh, Barstow, and then end up out in Santa Monica. Well, as it would make stops along the journey, you'd find little hidden places. You'd find wonderful off-the-road, off-the-path kind of places. And great memories we've made, great uh, insights would be gained. I hope that's the same as we go from Genesis to Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, stop over in Joshua and Judges and Ruth and maybe check out some Joel and some Micah and some Zephaniah. Zephaniah is in the Bible, in the Word of God. Mark and Philippians, Titus, Philemon, John, Jude. And of course, uh, we'll not look long at Revelation, I promise. Amen. But uh, this Route 66 in America is officially titled, or was officially titled, the Will Rogers Memorial Highway. Uh, also known as the Main Street of America, the Mother Road to some. The Bible also has many titles, the Word of God, the Sword of the Spirit, the Bread of Life, the Hammer and the Fire, the Sword, so many other names. Uh, it's great opportunity for us to go and to give some information, but the difficulty of studying like this is to not give too much information, to not become more... <coughs> <clears throat> just information overload and not really give us something that will help us. And uh, I was starting today looking at what I would leave out. Well, if you would imagine looking at the book of Genesis 
what you would put in or leave out. And so in desperation, I called a friend and I said, you did this five or six years ago. How did you do it? And he gave me some, some good ideas and some, uh, some encouragement. But, uh, you know, I also want to encourage, inform, but also challenge each evening as we did that. Now, one other parallel to Route 66 that I want to give you tonight before we get into to why we want to do this. One other parallel, par parallel is this. Route 66 was decommissioned several years ago. It is no longer considered uh, a main road. Obviously, the interstates have taken over. Uh, it's not traveled by very many. In fact, for many, it's neglected. Uh, it's not remembered. And uh, the great history and the great days of the past are no longer celebrated because to many, it's a distant memory. This is the most striking of the comparisons that I find to the 66 books of the Word of God. To so many, the Word of God is a distant memory, some old path that others used to travel that's no longer popular, uh, no longer used today. And just as Route 66 speaks of better days in America, the Word of God speaks of better days in America as well when people travel down the road of God's Word on a daily basis. And so tonight, uh, let's go back and, and begin our journey, not from Chicago to Santa Monica, but from uh, Genesis to Revelation. And I want to give you five reasons tonight that uh, I want to give you this study, this overview. Number one, to identify the location of the books. Very simple, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. We're going to learn the books of the Bible. I was thinking about RU, and I was going to point out our RU banners, but they won't be up till tomorrow. But every week we come in and we say the RU principles. Well, by the end of our 66 uh, books together, we're going to be able to say the books of the Word of God in order. Now, some of you say, I, I learned that. My wife can stand up here. She can do it in English, Creole, backwards, forward, sideways, up, down. Uh, but for many of us, when the preacher says, find Philemon, we get that deer in the headlight look. Or if, if they said Joel or Amos, Obadiah, one of those more minor prophets. So just to identify the location. Number two, to recognize the major themes. By the way, I've got notes tonight. I did not give those notes out, did I? I am so prepared. Brother Allen, Brother uh, Daryl on the back table, Brother Brian, Brother David, get those notes out tonight. Goodness gracious, I'm giving you material and nobody's writing it down. Well, I know you're, you're writing it down. <laughs> Number two, to recognize the major themes or major theme of each book so that you can say, oh, that book speaks of, and then you can be able to identify the major thing. Number three, memorize the books of the Bible in their order. Number four, to learn key verses, important verses of each book. But then number one, and, and Brother Darrell, this is where I hope really we have success in this, to see Jesus Christ from Genesis to Revelation. That's really what I want you to see, that, to see Jesus Christ from Genesis to Revelation. How many of you have done a study like this at a church you've been in where you've done an overview of Genesis to Revelation? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten of us. So tonight, let's pray as we begin that this would be exciting, this would be informative, and be helpful to us. Heavenly Father, as we begin now this look at your inerrant, inspired, preserved word, I pray, Heavenly Father, you'd give us a great understanding, a great passion to, to know the word and to love the word of God more and more. Tonight, I pray, God, you'd help me to preach, to teach, Lord, exactly in the manner and method in which would be most pleasing to you, most helpful to our people. We ask it now that you would Breathe on us and help us, Lord, to love the Word in a greater way, to know the Word in a greater way, to apply the Word in a greater way, and to help others to know the Word as well. I pray for my friend's family. I pray you'd bless his wife. I pray you'd help his children. And God, my heart is broken. My heart is heavy for him, his family. I pray you'd just encourage. Thank you that he had such a strong, wonderful testimony of faith in Jesus Christ. No question that Tom loved you and had given his life for you and was a real Christian, a genuine article. And God, I pray that his death would bring others to faith in you. 
we ask now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, for those of you that don't know this, this will be good for you. For those of you that do know it, just smile and make me feel good, all right? Uh, number one tonight, and I have 20 points. Don't you like that? One, one book a week. So we're going to have to get a lot of information. In the immortal words of the great theologian, Burt Reynolds, we have a long way to go and a short time to get there. Actually, I think that's the immortal words of Jerry Reed, but that's all right. Number one, time and language, time and language. Nearly the entire Old Testament was written in the language of uh, Hebrew. Genesis is no exception. The original title of Genesis in Hebrew means the beginning. Bereshit means the beginning. And this is an appropriate title, the beginning, for it is the beginning of the word of God to us. But we do not use the word beginning out of the Hebrew language. We use the word Genesis, which is translated out of the Greek language. About 250 years before the time of Christ, the Greek translators gave their own title, Genesis, to the first book of the Old Testament. The Greek word genosis means origin, source, generation, or beginning. Genosis is a translation of the Hebrew word, which means generation. This is also quite an appropriate title because generation, gen, Genesis is indeed a history of the origins, birth, genealogies, and generations of all men. And so if you said this is the book of Genesis, which is the book of generations, or you say this is the book of beginnings, both would be correct. This is where God chose to start his revealed word. Now, we don't believe that Genesis is the oldest of the writings. We believe that title belongs to the book of Job. But Genesis is where God used Moses to give us the beginning, the origins, or the books of generations. Now, number two, I already mentioned the author is Moses. Now, Moses never claims authorship in any of the five books given his, his name to. But we know that from other places that we find he is clearly the author of the first five books of the New Testament. The Bible calls these books the law. The Bible calls these books the law in Exodus, Deuteronomy, and Kings, and Ezra, and Daniel, and Malachi, and Mark, and Luke, and John, and Acts, and Romans, Corinthians. It's also called the Pentateuch. So if I said the law of Moses, or the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible, or if I said Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you would know we're speaking of the books written by Moses. Now, Luke reminds us of something interesting about the authorship of Moses. The Bible says in Acts chapter 7, verse 22, so good to see Brother Rick back with us. God bless you, Brother Rick. I've been gone now for a few weeks in Africa, and I look great. God bless you. How many of you were afraid Brother Rick was going to come back with a bone in his nose right there? Just a spear. He got clothes on in his right mind. Praise the Lord. Good. But Luke reminds us in Acts that God had allowed Moses, listen, to be trained in the wisdom of the Egyptians. He had been prepared by God to integrate, understand all available records, manuscripts, oral narr narratives which he penned the Pentateuch. There was no more prepared man in all the world or qualified man to take on the immense task of writing the history of Israel, the origins or the beginnings than Moses. Now, we believe this, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. We believe that God moved on the heart and hand of Moses to write down. But you understand, Moses was able to take the historical writings, the oral traditions, and then his first-hand knowledge and compile them all together so that we had a clear, concise, Holy Spirit breathed record of the beginnings of the Genesis or the origin. Now, the date or the setting, number three, and we're just moving right along. If I preach like this all the time, we'd have short sermons. Amen. Uh, the date or the setting is very interesting. Genesis spans more time than any other book in the Bible. In fact, listen to this. It covers more than all other 65 books of the Bible put together. 2,400 years from the time of creation to the time of the Exodus, 2,400 years. And, and it's interesting, again, to prove just the authority of the Word of God in perfect synchronization, 
perfect order, perfect everything. You say, preacher, we can't get history the last few years together here in America. And yet God allowed Moses to take 2,400 years of human history from the origin to the exodus. And without fault, without error, without any kind of mess up, he laid out the origin of man. Now, the, the setting of Genesis divides into three basic areas or three geographic uh, uh, geographical areas. The Fertile Crescent, that's the beginning, 1 through 11. Israel, 12 through 36. And Egypt, chapters 37 through 50. The setting of the first 11 chapters changes rapidly and spans more than 2,000 years and 1,500 miles. The middle section of Genesis spans about 200 years and moves from the Fertile Crescent to the land of Canaan. The final setting is Gen in Genesis is found in Egypt where God brings in 70 souls and walks out with upwards of 3 million souls. They did quite some begetting while they were down in Egypt. Amen. The audience, number four, the audience, who is he writing to? Well, since the book announces that all people of the earth will be blessed through Abraham, it seems fair to conclude that Everyone can benefit from the Genesis account of creation. And by the way, those of you that just came back from the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum, uh, did not that help you to see the account of creation come alive to you and to understand even more clearly what God did in bringing something out of nothing, ex nihilo, something from absolutely nothing that God brought into existence by his very word, the breath of life from out of nothing. Now, the purpose, number five of Genesis, I believe is very clear, to reveal how the sin of man is met by the intervention and redemption of God. The sin of man is met by the intervention and redemption of God. Boy, it's something about Genesis. It's not long after creation we see the fall. But it's not long after the fall that we see the love of Christ demonstrated and that he already is promising that promised seed that would take away the sin of man. The purpose to reveal how the sin of man is met by the intervention of and redemption of God. Number six, the theme. The theme, I believe, and th this is just me studying. You can get other ideas from other good men. But I wrote down, and I've chosen to use, God's choice of a nation through, he, through whom he would bless all other nations. God's choice of a nation through whom he would bless all other nations. And I still say, even now some 6,000 years plus of creation that God still blesses a people Amen. that bless his people Israel. Right. We, we are in a bad way when we get away from blessing the people that God blesses. And we get away from the promise of God's blessing. Key words, number six, number seven. Key words in the book of Genesis. Beginning and blessing. Beginning and blessing. We find the beginning of everything in creation. I'm going to say more about that in just a moment. Everything has the beginning in Genesis. The blessings are also associated to the obedience of God and his word. The key phrase, number seven, found six times in the book of Genesis. And in you, all the nation of the earth shall be blessed. Now we know that it was from Abraham's promised seed. That the Messiah would come. And from the Messiah we would see his death, his burial, his resurrection. The payment of the sin debt for all men. The nations of the earth have been blessed through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Could you repeat that key phrase? Key phrase. And in you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Now take your Bible. We're going to come back to Genesis Chapter number three in just a moment. But take your Bible. I want you to look at key verses with me. Genesis chapter one, verse one. Very easy. You should know that one, right? Key verses number nine. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Never, ever, ever in his word does God defend himself. God simply states his truth. In the beginning, God 
created the heaven and the earth. Key verse number two, and we'll come back and spend a little bit of time tonight here as we close. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Key verse number 2. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Genesis 3.15. Look at key verse number 3. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be blessed. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Three key verses speaks first of all of the creation of God. Second of all, the salvation of God. Number three, the blessing of God. The creation of God, the salvation of God, the blessing of God. The key, the key note number 10, if you're riding along with me, the key note number 10, did you know the book of Genesis is quoted over 200 times in the New Testament? In fact, chapters 1 through 11 is quoted more than 100 times in the New Testament. Not just mentioned, but being quoted word for word over 165 times in the New Testament. This gives no credibility to the idea of theistic evolution because God himself in the form of Jesus Christ and the other prophets and preachers of the New Testament referred back to Genesis as the record of the creation of man. Listen, if Jesus established it, he believed it, we too must say in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Number 11, the key lesson. God created us for blessing and chose us to be a blessing. You say, preacher, I'm not an Israeli. I'm not a Jew. No, but we're children of faith as if we were Jews because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. We have the blessing as the chosen. We have the blessing as the children of God through faith. We're not natural seed, but we're that wild seed grafted in, that wild vine grafted in. And so while God chose the nation of Israel to bless and to be a blessing, then those of us, our children of Abraham by faith, have been blessed and are to be a blessing. By the way, I'm blessed. Amen. God's been good to this boy. God's been good to us. And, and I have no, no reason in the world that I should not be a blessing to others as good as God's been to me. That's right. Key lesson, God created us for blessing and chose us to be a blessing. Number 12, I want to give you this in every book if the Lord will have us go through this the way I, I picture it. And I'm, I'm writing this out as we go on board. I'm gathering material. I'm not just using one person's uh, outline. Uh, I would like to have found somebody that had an outline that I liked as much, but um, I'm working through it all. And uh, I hope that as we come through every book, we see number 12, Christ Amen. in the book, Christ in Genesis. In Genesis, we find that the mentions of Christ are general to very specific. We see in Genesis 3.15, Christ is the seed of the woman. Genesis 3.15 is the first mention of Messiah in all the Word of God. Christ as a seed of the woman. Genesis 4.25. Christ from the line of Seth. Genesis 9.27. Christ from the line of Shem. Genesis 12.3. Christ from the line of Abraham. Genesis 21, 12, Christ from the line of Isaac. Genesis 25, 23, Christ from the line of Jacob. And one of my favorites, Genesis 49, verse 10, Christ who will be the lion of the tribe of Judah. 
315, 425, 927, 12, 3, 21, 12, 25, 23, and 49, 10. Seed of the woman, line of Seth, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah. But I like this as much as the direct scriptural mentions. I love the types and shadows in Genesis. Adam, number one. Adam, a type of him who is to come. Romans chapter 5 and verse 14, jot that down. Both entered the world through a special act of God as sinless men. Adam is the head of the old creation. Christ is the head of the new creation. As Adam was the first Adam and fell, the second Adam comes to redeem. Beautiful picture. Number two, Adam is a type. Number two, Abel. Oh, listen, this is good. Abel, the accepted offering. Yes. Abel, of course, offered that which was asked for. Cain offered that of willful self. God rejected Cain but accepted Abel. Jesus is the only accepted sacrifice of God. You bring religion, you bring works, you bring merits, you bring self. And as Cain was rejected, you too will be rejected. But as Abel brought the blood, nothing but the blood. Number three, oh, listen, the king of righteousness, oh, Melchizedek. Unknown origin, unknown everything. All he does is show up and show out. The king of righteousness made like the son of God. The king of peace brings forth the bread and the wine as the priest of the most high God. Melchizedek, and I'm telling you, that's a beautiful study of the person and work of Christ, the king of peace. But, but you know the greatest type in the Old Testament, Genesis, Joseph. Joseph, that beloved son, but yet hated brother who came unto his own, and his own received him not. They hated him so much, they tried to kill him. Threw him in a pit, threw him in prison. Ended up in a, a place that they thought they'd done away, and yet, as he comes forth, he comes forth to rule and reign. Amen. And even to forgive them. Yes. Rejected becomes their ruler. Conspired and sold, condemned yet raised from humiliation to glory by the power of God. Man, that's a you could spend your whole ministry on the person of Joseph and the life of Joseph and, and you see so much of Christ there. Number 13, quickly an overview, quickly an overview. And by the way, my clock back there is, is dead. It says 10 minutes after 7. I look up there and get happy. I'm thinking, man, we're doing great. I, I'm, I'm not going to go more than 15 minutes on any of these messages, I promise. The literary structure of Genesis is built around 11 separate units, each broken down with the generations. This is the book of generations. So in the beginning, chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, and three, you have the introduction to the generations. First generation in the beginning, God. Second generation, chapter two, verse four, through chapter four, verse 26, the generations of the heaven and earth. Chapter five, verses one through six, Adam. Chapter six, down through chapter nine, Noah. Chapter 10, the sons of Noah. Chapter 11, Shem. Chapter 11, Terah. Chapter 25, Ishmael. Chapter 25, Isaac. Chapter 36, Esau. 37, Jacob. Just an overview so you kind of get the 50 chapters in mind. Number 14, the outline. Now, this is where we'll spend just a few minutes. 
Chapter number 14, the outline. We have two points on the outline. Number one, the origin of the universe. The origin of the universe. The four great events of Genesis 1 through 11. Number one, creation. Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1 and 2, the creation. It was not just a few, seems like, pages that we see the glory of God in creation until we see in Genesis 3 through 5, the fall of man. You say, preacher, if we had better circumstances, we'd be better. No, if you had perfect circumstances, you'd still sin. Because right. Adam and Eve couldn't have any better circumstances, and yet they still sin. Because of the fall, chapter 6 through 9, the judgment of God in the great flood. Noah's flood. Chapters 10 through 11, after the flood, man again goes back to selfish religion. And they're going to exalt themselves. No need of God. The Tower of Babel, the tongues, confusion, the confusion of tongues. So the four great events of chapters 1 through 11, creation, chapters 1 and 2. The fall, chapters 3, and 4, three 4, and 5. The flood, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And then the confusion of tongues at Babel, 10 and 11. And I will say this, just, just by way of, of, of making a note here. Babel is what began all of what we now see as the modern confusion of the world's religions, false gospels, false hopes. All can be traced back to the root of Babel in Genesis chapters 10 and 11. Then we see the second of the two great divisions of Genesis. We have 50 chapters. The first 11, the origin of the universe. Four great events there, creation, fall, flood, confusion of tongue. But number two, the order of the patriarchs. The order of the patriarchs. The origin of the Hebrew nation goes back to four great men that God chose from Genesis 12 all the way to Genesis 50 is the story first of all father Abraham Genesis 12 through 24 from father Abraham we find his son Isaac chapters 25 and 26 from Isaac we have woeful Jacob chapters 27 through 36 and then we close with wonderful Joseph chapters 37 through 50. So all the book of Genesis basically has two sections. Chapters 1 through 11, we have the creation, the fall, the flood, the confusion at Babel. Chapters 12 through 50, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Now, as we look at the key points of this, I want you to see in number 15 there, the beginning of all things is really traceable to the book of Genesis. The law of prime mention, if you study your Bible, you need to know the law of prime mention. It means this, the first time that you see something mentioned is the order for all subsequent times normally. In fact, I would be very hard pressed to tell you a time that the law of prime mention did not apply. Now I'm not saying not every time, but normally the first time you see something is the way it'll apply in all subsequent times. So let's go back and remember or think about what began in Genesis. Well, first of all, I began, I believe, I didn't begin in Genesis. Warren may have began in Genesis, but I didn't begin in Genesis. Number one, human time began. You say, Bridger, what was time like before? God is not held by time. God is always in the present. So we begin keeping time when? Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. That wasn't the beginning of God. God has always been. But that was the beginning of human time. So you say, well, how old is man? How old is the earth? Well, listen, we know this. God is unknowable, but we can get a pretty good idea of human time because we can go back to the creation of man, Adam and Eve, in the garden, in the book of Genesis. So we have the beginning of time. Number two, we have the beginning of man. Man was not some amoeba 
that slimed his way out of the ocean, Amen. that stumbled his way across the jungle, that sat upright one day and became president of something. <laughs> Man was created as man is. Animals were created. So, preacher, what about evolution? There's never been a species change. Now, there's variations. And you learned this on your creation tour. God did not take every dog species. He took dog. And now they're dog species. But that comes from breeding and changing them. But dog, watch this, always been dog. What, a cat didn't self-identify one day. <laughs> Say, I feel like I'm going to be a dog today. The beginning of man. Number three, the beginning of marriage. Yes. The law of prime mission. As God ordained marriage, we should recognize marriage. Amen. How did God ordain marriage? A man Amen. shall leave father and mother, cling to his wife. These two will be one flesh. The order, leave and cleave. Leave before there was a home to leave from. The beginning of marriage. Number four, the beginning of government. The order of structure in government. Of course, the beginning of sin. The beginning of sin. We see the beginning of redemption as given to man. Now, redemption has always been in the mind of heart of God before the foundation of the world were, but we see it unveiled to man. And of course, I want to write this down to you because I want to close with this in just a moment. We find the beginning of the gospel. The gospel is in Genesis. In fact, God's word declares the gospel to be found in Genesis. Now the key prophecy of the book of Genesis is found in verse 15. Let's go there, please. Genesis chapter 3. The word of God says, and they heard the voice, verse 8. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Mm. By the way, just so you get an idea here, I believe this was something of a familiar routine. I believe they would fellowship together. God created Adam for his pleasure. Part of pleasure to God was fellowshipping with his creation. And on a day that was to be what should have been a normal day of fellowship turned into this horrible day of the recognition of sin. He said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that I was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, the woman, I love it, blame shifting 101. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord, the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, and so forth, so on of the curse. But in chapter 3 verse 15 we have the great key prophecy that while Satan would bruise the heel of Christ Christ would crush the head of Satan Amen. That's right. now you know and I know and we, we won't take time but you know and I know that in the days as they led up to the crucifixion and as Satan began to Whip that crowd into a frenzy. Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and our children. What a horrible statement to make. By the way, the blood is still on their children. And you know that in those days and hours leading up to 
to the cross that Satan must have just been thinking, I got this. After all these years, I, I finally got the upper hand. And, and, and as they beat him, and they ripped the clothes from him, they ripped the skin off his frame, and, and they humiliated him and spat on him. And as they drug him out and hung him between heaven and earth on that cross, you think to yourself, how heaven must have wept and hell must have hallelujahed. And as he gave up the ghosts and the rocks ran and the sky darkened, Satan must have thought, I've won, I've won. And, and for three days, hell must have had just a party. And boy, I mean, it should have been for the, for the devil. It, it, was, it was Super Bowl. It was Christmas. It was birthday. It was homecoming all rolled into one. He bruised his heel. The Son of God suffered and died for the sin of man. And it looked like evil had won and good had lost. But on the third day, Amen. Amen. I love it. I love it. Amen. You got to know. Now, I don't, shoot, man, I, I speculate on this kind of stuff. It ain't in the Bible, but I think it is. <laughs> it should be, you know what I'm saying? About that, about that second day, 23rd and a half hour, just some trembling, some rumbling, some yep. what's going on here. And as we got down to two hours or, or two days, 23 hours, 59 minutes. I mean, it, Satan's got to be thinking, uh-oh, uh-oh. And at go time, when he thought he had won, and Jesus just said, I'll take those keys, and I'm going to rise up out of here. First, I'm going to preach to the captives that I have won. Then I'm going to go back and let the folks up there know that I've won. But most of all, Satan, I'm going to let you know that I've won. Now, he may have bruised him, but Jesus crushed him. Amen. Let me tell you this. The old church may be a little bruised right now, but in the end, she's on the winning side. Amen. Amen. Don't be too discouraged. We've already won the day. Genesis 3.15, Satan was told, you're going to get a little hand up here, but overall, you're going to lose. Now, let me give you this, and this is my, literally, I have, I have, favorite of a lot of things but I heard this message years ago back in the early 90's it is without question my favorite Bible message it's found in the book of Galatians you say preacher we're in Genesis I know but I told you the gospel was all the way back in Genesis yeah. let me give you the key picture in my opinion now the key verse is Genesis 3.15 and the blessings and all the promises but I want to give you the picture that I think is the best the most wonderful of all pictures. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 6. Are you there with me? I told you a moment ago, I said the gospel was found in Genesis. The gospel. Now, 1 Corinthians tells us what the gospel is, correct? The gospel is the what? Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if the gospel is in Genesis, we must see the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Even, verse 6, Galatians 3, even as Abraham oh, here we are. Yeah. believed God, Amen. and it was accounted to him for righteous, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying in thee shall all nations be blessed so that they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham now look at it because I, I, I don't want you to think I'm making this up seeing or foreseeing that the that God would justify the heathen through faith Preached before the gospel unto Abraham. We said there were types and shadows throughout the book of Genesis. Joseph was one of the great types. But you know there is a greater type even than Joseph. And I love Joseph and I've 
I've preached on that bow that breaks over the wall, and I've, I've, I love it. But that son of Abraham, Isaac, you say, preacher, what do you mean? How did Abraham have the gospel preached unto him? Now, I certainly don't have time to, to go back. He was the promised son, the miraculous birth, and daddy loved that boy. He was his first begotten. He was his prominent, preeminent son. He, he loved him. And God said, Abraham, who do you love more? You love me or that's... Do you love the promiser or the promise? They were saying, I love you. He said, well, let's see. Took him out. By the way, three days journey. He said, preacher, what do you think? When God told Abraham that he was going to take the life of that boy... That boy was as good as dead for three days. Abraham and Isaac go to the mountain. Where'd they go? What was the name of the mountain? You study it out. You study it out. You're going to find that Mount Moriah very probably, most likely, is the same mount that we call Calvary. You study it out. That it's, it's, it's every conservative scholar I read says it's the same mount place they get off their mounts and the boy looks at his daddy and says daddy we got the wood and we got the fire we don't have a sacrifice we don't have a lamp God now listen to the language Amen. will provide himself and say God will provide us God will provide himself a lamp Amen. they go up that mountain Amen. interesting and again I, I wish I could preach it all to you Took the wood off the donkey. The donkey is a picture of man, rebellious and stubborn. Took the wood off the donkey, put the wood over on Isaac's back. Yes. Isaac climbs the mountain with the wood. The donkey is set, set, set at peace. They climb the mountain. You know the story. Isaac willingly lays down because he could have said no. At that age and that difference, he could have run away. Will lays down, draws the knife back. Goes to take his life. The angel stops. The ram in the thicket. <clears throat> Read the text. Abraham comes off the mountain. Never mentions Isaac coming off the mountain. We don't see Isaac again. Until he comes out in the field at eventide. As Eleazar, the unnamed servant of the house. Brings the bride from the foreign country we don't see Isaac until he meets the bride not in Ur of the Chaldees and not in Canaan but in the middle ground out in the field every one of those is a perfect type of Jesus Christ who bore our sin was crucified buried rose again we don't see him again why the ascension next time we see him again the rapture of the church when the bride is brought out by the Holy Spirit. Then, after Jesus takes the bride, after Isaac takes the bride, Rebecca, something starts stirring in old Abraham again because Sarah's long dead. He takes Keturah to wife. After the church is taken out, God will have a rekindling of that love for Israel, and Israel will be made whole again after the rapture during that tribulation time yes. you can go from beginning to end in the life of Isaac and see the entire gospel from miraculous birth to vicarious death to glorious resurrection to blessed ascension to the second coming wow. say preacher why, 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 why are we studying Genesis because it speaks of Jesus Amen. Amen. speaks of Jesus when you know that Jesus is as alive in Genesis as he will be in the Gospels, it once again proves that you hold in your hand a divinely inspired, preserved, perfect book. I hope as we take this Route 66, now I don't think we'll find the largest ball of twine or whatever else is across that route, but I think we're going to find some little nuggets along the way that are going to make us appreciate and love the word even that much more. Let's pray together, shall we, Father?
Bless your word to our heart. Thank you for this good book. Lord, thank you for the 